Welcome to the Western Division Toastmasters Contest. Let's go in and see what's going on. Here we are at the Western Division Postmasters Contest. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Welcome everybody. My name is Sergio Salazar. I am a Sergeant at Arms. I am also a member of the Naperville Metropolitan Postmasters. And I'd like to start this meeting off with and have you all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you everybody for joining me. And I want to welcome everybody and make sure you're in the right place today. This is the West Division Evaluation of Morris Speech Contest. I would like to, at this time, recognize some dignitaries that we have in attendance today. If you could please stand, um, real quick, after I call your name. Shar Gildersleeve. John Lab. for a 
evaluation. And there will be a lot of examples for us to learn from. At this point in time, I would like to call up the chief judge who will review some of the rules and the time. Uh, Maddie Gray. Thank you, our first division governor for the West Division. We welcome everyone, all the contestants and functionaries for the evaluation and humorous speech contest have been briefed prior to this meeting. The timing rules for today would now be announced by our chief timer, Ms. Carol Henry.
Mr. Toastmaster, the timing speech for the target speaker, the speech is five to seven minutes. A green card will be given at five minutes, the yellow at six, and the red at seven. Uh, for a speech, uh, no other indication will be given until the speech is completed. Evaluation contest. Sean Wondro. How not to train your dachshund. <laughs> how not to train your dachshund. Sean Wondro. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and guests. Fifteen years ago, my family got a dachshund as our first pet. And to this day, our dachshund has never done anything that we told him to do. <laughs> he is his own dachshund. So, but luckily for all of you, I have learned from the mistakes that my family has made, and I've developed some quick tips to help you avoid our mistakes. My goal is when all of you leave here today is that you remember these three tips on how not train your dachshund. The first tip, do not let your dachshund out of his crate on the first night. The reason this is the first tip is this is the first thing that you will face as a new dachshund owner. My family went out and bought the finest of crates for our young dachshund, and we filled it with the finest of pillows and bedding, and we thought this will be a great home. For, for our new dachshund. So we tried to put him into his cage on the first night, and he started to whimper, and maybe to moan a little bit, and it progressed to the point of barking. And we lasted maybe a few hours. We said, no, this is okay. You have to give the dachshund time to get used to his new home. Eventually, he'll come to love his home. But we gave in, and we let him out and he never went back into his creek. <laughs> and to this day, he maintains ownership of half of my parents' king-size bed. <laughs> so remember, do not let your dachshund out of his crate on the first night. My second tip for all of you is do not feed your dachshund food from the table. <laughs> I will blame my father for this one he thought it would be a good idea to give our dachshund the scraps of food from the steak that he'd been eating. And my dachshund agreed that it was a fantastic idea. <laughs> <laughs> and he thoroughly enjoyed it. But then, he thought it would be a good idea to get scraps of food every night. And, and it really isn't. So he, he would come up to your chair, and he'd look up at you with his little cute little dachshund eyes, and he'd kind of let out a little bit a bark, and eventually we'd give in, and we would feed him again. You see, our dachshund had trained us, and that is a mistake you don't want to make. So remember, do not feed your dachshund food from the table. Now my third tip for all of you is, just because you read it in a book about dachshunds does not mean that it's true. <laughs> you see, we were a good family preparing for our dachshund, and we did our background checks and our research, and we read that dachshunds absolutely love to swim. There were tons of pictures of dachshunds in rivers, having a blast, having a great time, and we thought, this is perfect, because we have a pool, our dachshund will love to swim with us in our pool. So, we took our dachshund out, and within about a foot of the pool, he got completely crazy, and he started kicking his legs wildly. We said, oh no, this is, this is very bad. I guess our dachshund doesn't love to swim. We didn't understand this because we thought he was supposed to love to swim. But we realized that he was actually just trying to swim in the air. He was preparing himself to go in the water. So he started doing his doggy paddle in the air. We said, oh, okay, it's okay. He really does want to swim. He's just 
getting ready. So we finally put him in the water, and he's a fantastic swimmer. I've never seen a dachshund swim faster to get out of the water. <laughs> and he ran off, shook himself dry, and he's never got back in the pool. So our dachshund did not love to swim at all. Remember, just because you read it in a book about dachshunds does not mean that it's true. So my family has certainly had some struggles with our dachshund, and he certainly isn't very well trained at all. But we do love him very much. So I hope that all of you, whether you're getting a new dachshund or just a new pet for yourselves, you try and remember these three rules that I've shared with you today. The first being, do not let your dogs sit out of the crate on the first night. The second being, do not feed your dogs in food from the table. And the third, just because you read it in a book about dachshunds does not mean that it's true. All right, thank you everyone. Fine now. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. So, what is your education level? I have a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. Okay. What? Northwestern. Actually, let me. Re that's that's very impressive. But let me rephrase the question. What other speech is this? Toastmaster. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is my third speech. Your third Get speech. Wow. What a great speech. Your third speech. potential for a future humorous speech that I contest in there. I don't know. There's something about dachshunds that are just inherently humorous. They have a tubular body with those little stubs in the middle of one. It's quite cute. So, and how, do you have other dogs in the family? No, only the one. Just some dachshunds. How did you decide upon a dachshund as your, your canine companion? You know, my, my mom was friends with a breeder, a dachshund breeder, I guess, and he showed her the puppies. I just, I just wandered over okay. So we had never had a pet before. So this was quite surprising. Your first dog? Yeah, first dog. And what's the name of your dog? Uh, Wrinkles. Wrinkles, okay. <laughs> My family has got a history of dachshunds. For some reason, they every family member at some point or other, except for, except for me, is owned a dachshund. So there's one thing I've noticed is they're very spunky dogs. They are. He's, he's very excitable. He likes to run around a lot. He likes to bark at a lot of things. He's a wonderful dog. They are. He's well. I know my, my sister's got a dachshund that, named Lucy that she had before her other dogs. And she got two giant labs, but that dachshund just knows it's in charge of the house. So it's about a fifth their size, and it, they don't dare tell that dachshund what to do. <laughs> they have some red marks on their nose if they try. <laughs> 
<laughs> so what inspired you what inspired you to join Toastmasters? Um we had a uh, let's see here. Our women's network at work was gonna bring a Toastmasters club to try and start it up at work. And I went to go talk to the uh, vice president of my company. He said, you know, I really think you ought to join that Toastmasters club. <laughs> so I said, uh, you got it. I, I joined the club. <laughs> so when the vice president of your company tells you that, does it have a little more weight than a friend in passing? It certainly does. <laughs> it certainly does. So how has it helped you in your job as a community engineer? Um, well, I think really the big thing for me is the impromptu speaking so I've always done decently well with prepared speeches but uh, not so well on the spot so I've probably done more table topping moments than anyone else in the club okay. so I think it's really helped a lot. All right, great. Yeah, it's very good for getting you to think on your feet. Are you from this area? No, I'm from Houston actually. What project? I moved here from work okay. about two years ago. Think of Naperville, Naperville compared to Houston. I mean, it's quite similar. I lived in the suburbs of Houston as well, so it's, it's, it's might as well be the same place. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the weather was different. It's cold here, though. That's okay. true. Which you like better, the hot or the cold? Definitely the cold. The cold's much better. Okay. Why is that? Well, like I say, you can. It's, it's it's almost too high. You just get you. Know, you can't even go outside in Houston. Everything is air conditioned in Houston. You don't even go outside here. There's sometimes like today where it's actually nice outside. So. I'm, I'm actually from Oklahoma, which is like Houston, but not quite as humid. I saw it blazing hot. And first, I was a little put back by the cold, and I learned there's two months. You can get through January and February, the rest of the year is not bad. That's true. That's true. Especially if it's like last year. That's right. Summers are nice here, too. So, what, what got you into chemical engineering? Um, the, the, I'll be the, and I guess is uh, I like chemistry and I was good at math. Okay. So it kind of worked and uh, yeah, I picked it and went with it. Okay. It's been pretty good. How long have you been at practicing for Two years. Okay. By the time you've been here, <coughs> so it's, it's the same, yes. Okay. I see that you enjoy video games. What's your favorite video game? What's my favorite video game? Oh, that's a terrible question. Okay. Uh, Say, we'll say Legend of Zelda, The Ocarina of Time. Okay. There you go. Okay. That means nothing to me, but it sounds like a wonderful <laughs> game. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sean, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sean, we'd like to give you a certificate for a participation. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
so I know what it's like to have them run the roost. So that was a very um, appropriate topic for at least our family. I appreciated that. <coughs> I have a friend who has dachshunds, and she posts pictures once in a while of her dog in various poses. And when you talked about dachshunds in that way, the pictures all came together because there are always pictures of that dog taking charge of the household. So, wow, it really is true. Something that I wanted to point out, which I thought was very clever, is um, not clever necessarily, but uh, very key, is that you took advantage of your domain. And that's something I always coach people, is that this is your domain as a speaker. And I always tell people to take advantage of it and also to let the Toastmaster know what how you want to use that domain. And it's his job to make sure that it's ready for you. One thing I would have suggested, in addition, is probably to have this moved. Because you didn't need the lectern, obviously. You were very comfortable out here, and I think you favored this side because this was in the way, and it didn't give you a chance to move over here. Okay, so just something to think about in the future. Um, you also did something that's very unique, too, is I've always heard to make points in threes because people tend to grasp a message when it comes in groups of threes. And you used your fingers to say, I'm going to talk about three points, and then you numbered them, which was very clever too. I appreciated that because it made me wait for the next one. You have a very stoic humor about you. I like that. You know, I it wasn't slapstick style, so it was very nice and I appreciated that. You also had a very clever use of pauses when you spoke about the whimpering in the moment, etc. So that was a very uh, useful method of pauses. And can't even read my own notes. One thing I wanted to point out also is, as a presenter, you are the sample setter, example setter for the audience. So I would probably coach you in maybe dressing the part. Um, a lot of people here are a little more formal. You don't need to be because you're talking about dogs. Maybe it would have been clever for you to have a dog on your t-shirt or something to that effect. Or your dog's picture on your t-shirt, which would have been clever. So just a point to make. But overall, I would love to hear more stories of your dogs. I look forward to hearing you again, and thank you for the honor. We now have one minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. Madam Timer, would you signal when one minute is up?
favorite gesture. You were able to use a little bit of gesturing within your presentation as well, so that helps your presentation a lot. You tended to use your left hand for most of your gesturing, so you could incorporate a little bit of both gestures in there, it probably would enhance your presentation as well. <coughs> the, the standpoint of your opening and your body and conclusion, you got a very strong body where you only listed the three tips. For any speech that we can do, if we can limit our presentation to three main points, it's a very good, solid presentation. So that you did that very effectively. And in your close, you reiterated what your three main points were, and that was a very effective close as well. Your opening seemed a little bit on the shy side, I guess, in that you just barely introduced your subject matter, saying, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got a doxin and how not to train up some of the tips. So you might want to emphasize a little bit more what your goal would be for that presentation. So that your goal might have been to train the audience on how not to train a pet or how not to, whatever your main thoughts would be. I think you should emphasize that just a little bit stronger so that we walk away saying, I know what we're going to come out of this presentation where you start off right away and make that presentation. As far as your presentation style, I think everybody here was able to hear you effectively. You do have a a little bit of a soft side of a voice, so you could project a little bit more at times. There's some opportunities in there to make a little bit stronger vocal variety. When you talk about the dog when it coming out of the crate and wanted to get the attention of the, the family, you talked about it, it, it whimpered and then it moaned and then it barked. You could have emphasized that with just a little bit of different sound, the whimper of a dog or the, the moaning of a dog and the actual trying to bark would get the attention of the audience as well could be a little bit more effective and give you an opportunity to use the vocal variety. In respect, I, I think you were very effective in your presentation style. We were able to hear you effectively, perhaps use a little bit more gesturing, a little wider gesturing, that would be an effective means to get more attention as well. But I think we all learned from your presentation on how not to train a doxin and the other pet for that matter in fact, but congratulations, we'd like to hear from you. Conclusion, wonderful. 
it nice and short. He used a classic. There, there are six strong ways to close a presentation. He used one of them by summarizing the points you made and then encouraging us to follow. As far as your delivery, it was wonderful. You came up, you were confident, you didn't use any notes, you could engage yourself with the audience more. You had some effective use of pauses a little bit. I felt like you might have been a bit rushed sometimes. There was one place where I thought you really could have used a, a wonderful pause. We were talking about, I've never seen a dog swim so fast to get out of the pool. So there's something you can try to leverage a little bit more forward. And some wonderful visual descriptions of getting the finest crate to the finest bedding. I had this imagery of a loving family. They love their dog. They're putting it in this nice place. And it feeds them. What do you think? <laughs> you, you used one expression, and I have to say this on my wife's behalf because this always gets you to say, try and remember. She says it's supposed to be trying to remember. So that's one for all of us. I think we've all done that so, one time or another. Now, the best advice I can give you, this was humor speech, right? The best advice I can give is when you're giving humor speech, be serious. I don't know why, but it works. Because you're up here, you know you're trying to be funny, having fun with it. It was great, it relaxed and everything. But if you're serious, something about that adds that discontinuity or something to it that engages the audience and makes it more fun for them. Uh, another thing you could try is even though you had a strong ending, maybe tie it back to the beginning. This gives your speech a nice, I think of like a bow on a present, so the whole thing is tied up and nicely put together. And then you, you were very relaxed up here as you talked, but you tend to wander around a little bit. Something you can try is go to one side of the audience, make a point, and then as you transition over the other side, talk to someone else in the audience, make a point. Go ahead and make eye contact. If you're not comfortable with that, you can look up right here. They don't know the difference. <laughs> you have all the foundations of a wonderful speaker. You have a fun, humorous, engaging presentation style. Keep practicing, keep speaking. Toastmaster, we have all the ballots.
So I'd like to call to the lecturer, our first contestant, Amy Burnham. Amy? What club are you representing? Twice as nice. 8308. 8308. I didn't even have to ask. Just <laughs> reeled that up. That, that club's got a little bit of a different organization than most of our Toastmasters. Do you have to tell us about it a little yes, bit? Yes. It is a couples club. We live once a month at someone's home. Uh, one of our members. We don't invade anyone else's home. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and we have potluck uh, dinner. And then we have a meeting um, and socialize a lot. So it's a very fun club. So if anyone wants to come, you're more than welcome to come and visit us. The next meeting is uh, in Chicago, uh, Romans. So. Yes. You have a, a very Ask recent. Ask me about it. You have, a, okay. <laughs> you have a very recent winner of the Universe Speech Contest in, the, in your club. We do. Last year. Who is it? Who is it? <laughs> <laughs> Not today. Last year's winner. Oh yeah, Bob. Bob was a humorous speech contest. That's right. Uh, yes, he was the winner last year. Yes. And what is your Toastmasters education level? Who, me? Yes. Um, well, I guess why would we ask you? <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> uh, I am an ATM. But you know what? I am an ATM from the old version. They've changed it a lot, and so I have no idea what I am anymore. <laughs> I've done a lot of speeches. Okay. No longer count, huh? I have no idea. Just up to a lot. Okay. <laughs> said that some of your favorite things to do are spend time with your, your kids and family. Would you like to tell us yes. how many children do you have? Two. They're right here. There's Gabe and there's Margaret. And Stan. we have four dogs. Oh, wow. Yes. And a very large rabbit who's larger than a few of the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> that's, okay. that's quite a full family, right? Yes. Okay. It's a beautiful house. <laughs> okay. What types of dogs do you have? Um, they're Two of them are Chihuahuas, one's a Havanese, which is like a Bichon, and one's an Italian Greyhound, which looks like a Greyhound, but they're miniature size. Okay. They get along well with the rabbit. They do. Actually, the rabbit knows how to scoop them. Okay. So they'll <laughs> all chase after the rabbit, and all she has to do is turn around and look at them, and they go, Phew! Okay. Yeah. <laughs> also says that you enjoy reading. What are some of your favorite things?
to offer on the Toastmasters the opportunity to some of the experience that I've had. So as we start the new club, you want to have somebody that's got a little bit of knowledge and background on Toastmasters. So our Edison and Elmer's Toastmaster Club that I'm a main club member of, we decided to spin off the second club in the nearby area of Glendale Heights. So we put on a switchback program about three years ago and it was very successful and it was very good work. Wow, sounds like you could provide some advice to other clubs about how to how to spin off and, and generate new clubs. That's what those messages are here for. Okay. So you, those messages are one club wants to be able to help another club grow. You've got a lot of good opportunities for one club that can do that. Wow, that's great. So what what is your uh, profession? What do you do for a living? I'm an electronic test engineer by trade. We manufacture, contract manufacture, printed circuit boards for whatever product somebody wants to contract to build. But we make a lot of medical products, products, whether it's an ultrasound product, whether it's a something that can diagnose down to the DNA, a something that was able to determine from your blood what's going on. We build products for the telephone and for the telephone industry or the communication industry through Comcast. So we have a variety of customers out there. Get your hands on a lot of different things there. Yeah we do. It's all circuit boards for me. All circuit boards, okay. Yeah. So how has Toastmasters helped you in your profession? Well, I guess it's gone from the opportunity to not say anything. As an engineer, you typically don't, don't get called upon to speak a whole lot. So when I first started in Toastmasters 32 years ago, I was recognized by other Toastmasters in the company club that I belonged to that he needed some training in order to go out and make himself known. And so they dragged me out to a speech grant program that they were putting on back in 1980, and I've been a member ever since. Wow. Long, long history yeah. of this place. It's very impressive. And you enjoy bicycling, you said? Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah, I was kind of wondering whether this was going to be conflicting today's day. A week from today is our annual trip over to Three Oaks, Michigan, where they put on an apple cider century run. And I'll be participating in that for the 25th year in a row. The, when I first started out, I was able to go 100 miles without a problem. Now as I get older and older, it's harder and harder to go 100 miles, sometimes it's harder to go 25 miles. But depending on the situation, over the years I've been able to pull three kids as they're growing up, sometimes in the back of a trailer, and other times they put them on their own bikes, and you have to ride it a little bit slowly in order to keep up with them. But over 25 years, I've seen a lot of apples and a lot of cider. Okay. <laughs> The people who have completed a 100 mile bike ride and the people who have completed a marathon, it's like, I'm very impressed. You've done that once in your life, much less several times, and yeah. you clearly are motivated. It's, it's very impressive. Very well. You have some of your other, just your family, how many, how many children do you have? I have three children. They're 20, 22, and 25, and then I have a grandchild that's five years old now. They all live with us. All live with you? Oh. Wow. Oh. Another big household. <laughs> yeah, well, the 20 and the 22 year old are off to college, so I don't see too many of them around. My daughter's working, and she was with the five year old that I can Okay. So, the, the uh, 22 year old, 20 year old, do they block the toast specials also? Have you been able to interest them in that? No, not yet. They could benefit from it. There's <laughs> one, is a, one is a little on the shy side, and the other is probably to make a pretty good speaker. My daughter has attended a couple of meetings in the past, but not decided not to join. But they have to get out of school. That's one of the things we can encourage them to do. Okay. All right. Sounds like some future fighting Toastmasters there. Keith, I would like to thank you for the certificate of participation. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Next up, I'd like to call up our third contestant, Jeffrey Schmidt.
So we were also a neighbor of club together. I actually signed myself, this works for me, I signed myself up for a speech of the day. And then that makes me work toward it. Otherwise, just... Did you find yourself writing them at the last minute when you've done that? Or do you prepare and work it No, this one has been inspired by a fellow Toastmasters who also enjoys cycling. I know you're going to get to that. <laughs> That's right. It's on there. And people say they're centric, never in it, but it's come up over and over and over again to do that. But many, many years ago, I'd given a speech about the Tour de France, and everybody knows about the yellow jersey, but there's also a green jersey, a polka dot jersey, and uh, I don't know, like Well, anyway, there are three other jerseys, three other green jerseys, and I gave a wonderful speech about that years ago, so I'm going to dust that off. What's the longest, longest uh, bike ride that you've ever done? A little over 100 miles. Wow, very impressive. So there's one put on at the end of every summer by Bike Psychos down in Bike Psycho. Bike Psycho. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> goes out to, uh, I haven't done it for years now. I've, I've got to get back in state shape, but it goes out to the park and comes back to uh, start riding the area. How long does a 100 mile bike ride take you? All the time. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I, I get up. Get out there early because if you're going that long, it's going to take you a while. And I was talking to someone the other day, so this advice since it seems to be a lot of cyclists lately. If you're going out early in the morning and it's cold, the trick I learned is to take a couple sheets of newspaper and just stuff them up under your jersey. That will keep your core warm early in the morning. And then and as the day gets warmer, you just take that out and throw it in the trash bin. Good to go. That's a good idea. I think I do that when I go into work in a couple of months. <laughs> 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 and that's still lazy to get into your car. You're also into photography. Now, are you old school film that you developed or more digital? I was as a kid. My dad was an amateur photographer. We had a darker in the house. It was a lot of fun. As a kid, it's like magic. You know, you shine a light on a sheet of paper, you put it in the chemicals, and the image slowly comes out. And through the years, though, yeah, I used to develop my own film and all that, but as digital came out, it got better, and it's a lot easier just to have a digital camera where you get instant results, and then you put it on your computer and spend way more time than your wife thinks you should <laughs> manipulating the images. So honestly, my, my dad offered me all this little darkroom stuff, and I said I probably wouldn't really use it. It's getting more harder and harder to find places to actually develop it. So many of the places are not even in business anymore to develop it. And it's more environmentally friendly. Yeah, to not sure. Do. So you only usually keep about half a dozen of them, you no longer print hundreds of them, and then actually use half a dozen of them. You're also into music, guitar, and recording? Yeah, yeah. As, as a kid, I taught myself to play guitar. I had a long hiatus after being married, having kids, I think everybody goes through something like this. And then several years ago, I started playing again. And when I was younger, I always wanted to set up my own recording studio. And you can buy these four-track tape system or something back in the 80s. Now you can get software that will do so many things for you, and really you just need to get expensive interfaces into it. It's like any hobby, you can get really expensive, but I had a breakthrough this morning because I've been working off this little table. My wife said I could get a bigger table for the monitor system. So you'll have no idea how huge this is to me. <laughs> Any way to combine it? Do they have a bike path that goes down and you turn right back there? Uh, 
No, but now you've given me the opportunity, I'll tell you about something that was really impressive. While we were hiking down, a woman came running past us. She was out for a run. It was an emergency or anything. She came running past us. She had her water bottles. She had her rice cakes and everything. Pretty cool. She's running down the camp. A while later, we started running back. She had gone down the north running. You know, this is switchbacks. Down, cross, up the other side, the other rim, and just coming back all in the same day. Wow. <laughs> just, wow. To me, it's an inspiration that there are people like that out there. <laughs> okay. No matter what amazing accomplishment you do, there's always someone to just put it, put it in perspective for you. You've got to do your, That's right. your own personal best. Okay. Well, thank you very much for participating today. Thank you very much. <laughs> right through that door to your right. There's food there. And we will reconvene at, at 10 minutes till. So 10 minutes.